So yeah. So um, to begin with, I just wanted to talk about because some people asked me questions as to why do a retrospective of someone like Girish Kasavali who has already has, uh, you know, his films have been shown uh, uh, worldwide, everything, and maybe people are also aware of his cinema. So I thought, uh, how do I answer this question? Was something was a, is, a, is a kind of a um, thinking I had to do. Uh, so I think that one of the reason why we wanted to do it was that um, uh, in the in the current uh, uh, realm of cinema, what is happening is that there is way too much content. Like all your, like as all of you will know, you know we have Netflix and hundred other OTT channels. Also, you have movies at the click of a button. Unfortunately, you will find that none of these OTTs have films like these uh, because of various reasons, not least being the availability of a great print or uh, issues of ownership of who owns these films at all. Either the producers who were independent producers are no longer alive or, um, you know, or they are owned by the government, which is NFDC, right? So there is a, 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 there is a problem of ownership. Hence, uh, these movies haven't been able to get on to OTT. And hence, um, what has happened more or less is that these movies have become uh, are mostly watched in classrooms today in film schools, right, uh, as great Indian cinema. But we don't get a chance to exhibit them uh, in public spaces like this. Hence, that was one of the primary reasons to do this. Uh, secondly, I think we haven't had a Girish Kasavali retrospective in Bangalore um, for more than 15 years. So it's also been a long time for his films to be shown here. Uh, so uh, we also wanted to do uh, you know, to cater to the new audience which is coming and also, of course, to the older audience of Girish which has been there. Uh, so, and it also seems like a poignant moment uh, in our history of modern India to show these films which chronicle a certain Kannada society which we don't see so much in today's mainstream cinema, right? So these, uh, these two uh, were the uh, main reasons, right? Uh, and hopefully you'll all enjoy it. Uh, and uh, it has been quite a, it has been, we have been going back and forth for months because of sourcing prints and, you know, uh, talking to people, getting material, everything, etc. So there has been a lot of back and forth about these films. And even then, uh, now, uh, I don't know how many of you are aware, since the merger of uh, media units happened last year by the central government, no longer we get films from National Film Archives for free like we used to earlier, although it's public archives. Now they have been monetized under, everything has been merged under NFDC, which means that you have to pay a fee of like 15,000 rupees for each screening. So it has been very difficult to even uh, access the public archives now, and that's going to be an uh, ongoing challenge for all people who study films or are cinephiles to source the actual copies of the films from the National Film Archives because of these new rules uh, on the conversion of the archives to a corporation. Hence, uh, I think uh, w whatever this we are doing is a way to sort of, is an act to kind of counter this commercialization of public archives that is being done. So you all get to watch them free here without having to pay. So uh, that's, uh, that's another interesting thing we wanted to do, uh, the reason why we wanted to do. Um, just uh, the, to contextualize and historicize uh, this whole uh, Girish's work, we'll have to go back a little bit uh, uh, to 1949. Uh, Lekha, can you show the next slide? So this is a snippet from an article Satyajit Ray wrote in Statesman in 1949. The title of the article was, What is Wrong with Indian Cinema? Um, and if I may read it out for all of you, to anyone familiar with the relative standards of the best foreign and Indian films, the answers must come easily. Let us face the truth. There has yet been no Indian film which could be acclaimed on all counts. Where other countries have achieved, we have only attempted, and that too not always with honesty so that even our best films have to be accepted with the gently apologetic proviso that it is, after all, an Indian film. No doubt this lack of maturity can be attributed to several factors. The producers will tell you about the mysterious entity called the mass, 
which goes in for this sort of thing. The technicians will blame the tools and the director will have much to say about the wonderful things he had in mind but could not achieve. In any case, better things have been achieved under much worse conditions. The internationally acclaimed post-war Italian cinema is a case in point. The reason lies elsewhere. I think it will be found in the fundamentals of filmmaking. The raw material of the cinema is life itself. It is incredible that a country which has inspired so much painting and music and poetry should fail to move the filmmaker. He has only to keep his eyes open and ears, let him do so. Right, so uh, that's a snippet from his article, which created, of course, a lot of um, hue and cry amongst the commercial filmmakers and the Bombay industry, Bollywood, right? Uh, and uh, so this was one of the initial, I would call it as an inflection point to Indian cinema's growth, right? Uh, if you go to the next slide. Yeah, so if we look at this whole new cinema movement is being called in various names, either parallel cinema, Indian new wave cinema, or Indian new cinema. So these are many terms which have been used. Uh, Indian new wave is something I'm more comfortable with, so I use that. So these were some of the catalysts, right? So Satyajit Ray wrote an article, then in 1951, immediately after independence, uh, Nehru's government instituted a committee called S.K. Patel Enquiry Committee. The job of the committee was to find out uh, more about the Indian film industry and how we can improve uh, the film industry's uh, you know, stature in the world. How can Indian films be more acclaimed worldwide? Can we finance them? Can we export our cinema? Can it be a cultural export like how America did with Hollywood, etc. So these were the thoughts with that inquiry committee. And inquiry committee, of course, has submitted a report, which is a long report with very interesting observations. One of them was to set up a film finance corporation. So the film finance corporation basically said that if you have a great idea for a film, we'll finance it. Finance it in the sense that we will give you a loan. And uh, you can use that loan and make the film. And that's how this whole, uh, and this attracted many filmmakers who were graduating from the newly instituted uh, Film and Television Institution, Institute of India, FTII, right? It was instituted in 1961, so that was another inflection point because these were students who were going to FTII and looking at Bresson and you know world cinema in general uh, and were getting influence, so they were not interested in making uh, the kind of cinema which was prevalent in the commercial realm in India. So uh, they wanted to make how the cinema they were shown in the, f uh, in the institute. So then they all resorted to, you know, FFC to kind of make, the f make these films. Of course, before, just before this, Sajitri had made his own, by his own, on his own rather, the Apu trilogy and which became a globally recognized uh, uh, director made him globally recognized di director and the films also won in many awards abroad. So that also was an inspiration. Here is a different kind of cinema which can be successful because films like Pater Panchali were also commercially successful, not just successful uh, as art cinema or offbeat cinema, right? Uh, so these were all the inflection points and we also had film society movement as many of you who have been part of film societies everywhere would know. Uh, uh, Bangalore, of course, famously has, still has Sujitra Film Society, which was a very active part of the film society movement. Sajitra himself was the founder of the Calcutta Film Society, uh, so along with Chidanand Das Gupta. So, so these, these, all these, and they were watching all world cinema, right? So that uh, became like the education in the institute, education in the film society, uh, screenings, which kind of, uh, suddenly attracted not just businessmen. Before this, we should remember that the film as a profession was mostly attractive to businessmen who wanted to make money, you know, produce films and make money. Now it started to attract even the intelligentsia, you know, people who wanted, who would have rather written, written novels perhaps, sought to, you know, shifted to this new medium of cinema, right? Uh, so that, these are the sort of, uh, this is a snippet from the inquiry Report to inquire into the film industry's organization and growth and to indicate the lines for further development. Second, to examine what measures should be adopted to enable films in India to develop into an effective instrument for the promotion of national culture 
education and healthy en entertainment. And finally, to look into the possibility of manufacturing raw film, uh, those, those are non-digital days, so film export also was one of the idea. Right, um, yes, next. And uh, so this influence, created, uh, there was, this is also an era of manifestos, as uh, many of you have studied history will know. A lot of people were writing all kinds of manifestos, uh, even cinema manifestos in Germany, in, Fr in France. Uh, so our film makers also wrote a new cinema manifesto and it was written by Mani Call and, sorry, not Mani Call, Minal Sen and Arun Call, uh, and uh, they first published this. Uh, and this is what was their sort of concern Almost to everybody, making a film seems to be just a mechanical business of putting together popular stars, gaudy sets, glossy color, and a large number of irrelevant musical sequences and other standard meritorious ingredients. Hardly anyone conceives a film in terms of aesthetic experience and creative expression. So this concern is what they were trying to address, and they were mostly upset with the studio culture because a lot of... Um, monitoring and a lot of control of what the film is going to be was in the hands of the studios, right? The studios would decide. And uh, unfortunately, we seem to have come back. We have completed the vicious circle and come back to a point where now, if you say, for example, pitch to Netflix, Netflix will exactly tell you how to edit it, how to write it. Uh, so a lot of uh, uh, studio culture has come back to us in the form of OTT giants, right? So, but yeah, that was the concern. So how do you make independent films which has an artistic vision and which has a complete control of the artist, which, uh, which ended up, who ended up being called as auteurs? Uh, in French, auteur means an author, right? So, so what was born was what we call as auteur cinema in the sense that these were people where the director was the whole and soul. There was, you know, the collaboration was mostly in terms of technical collaboration, but the vision of the film, everything was controlled by the director. And starting from Satyajit Ray and many others in Indian New Wave, including Girish Kasavalli, are authors of Indian cinema. And so hence, that is why when we speak of them, we don't really, many times we don't really speak of their cinematographers, editors, actors, etc., because uh, most of the work on the film is controlled by this one person, right? So uh, this director, who is the whole and soul, right? Hence, uh, the new cinema manifest. Of course, uh, it doesn't mean that everybody, everybody who went to FTI or anyone read this manifesto or anything, but it just seemed to have happened everything at the same time and some kind of moment emerged, right? Uh, next. So uh, this is what uh, they sort of uh, proclaimed that a film should be, right? Film should be a personal expression of an individual artist. Uh, it should have a distinct stamp of creative artist and not of a studio. Uh, there has to be a ruthless search for truth in courts as an individual artist sees it. Emphasis should be on the right questions and not necessarily on the right answers, right? Uh, expects. Uh, and this is very important for our retrospective too. These films don't expect the audience to be a passive audience. It's a collaboration. Audience will have to participate uh, as a modern art will uh, demand. Right? Uh, must eliminate the role of exhibitors, distributors, to, to create art theaters. Some of these things didn't happen, like create art theaters didn't happen. That's why we, we ended up, many of these films didn't get exhibited in theaters because they didn't get a commercial release. Um, yes, next. Yeah, this was in the crux, rejection of the values, forms, performance modes, and style of mainstream commercial cinema that privileged entertainment values, spectacular display, and melodrama. A vision of cinema as an expressive art form, an inspiration from, and a sense of connectedness to a larger and serious international artistic enterprise. So this uh, was the ambition more or less of all these filmmakers who are called as Indian New Wave filmmakers or part are categorized as part of this movement, including Girish Kasavali, right? Uh, so the first four films, next. Yeah, the first four films made as part of this Indian New Movement were these four. Uh, I don't know how many of you know these films. Uh, Uski Roti was by Mani Kaul. Sara Akash was by Basu Chatterjee 
who uh, incidentally the only movie he made which can be categorized as an art film. Later on he went on to make more middle of the road cinema like we know. Uh, then Bhuvan Shom was by Minal Sen and Kanku, the Gujarati film, was by Kanti Lal Rathod. So these were the four, first four films which came under finance of Film Finance Corporation and in 1969, right? Coincidentally, of course, this was also happening. Coincidentally, in Canada, uh, if we move to... Uh, okay, before that. So what, do, what are the features of our... Uh, these kind of films, right? If we sort of look at all the films made under these umbrella of categories, we can say that there is, of course, no extraneous entertaining values, as in there is no irrelevant music, song, dance, which does not add to the story, it is not there, right? Uh, there is a lot of emphasis on reality and examination of the you know, socio-political complexities of India as a modern nation, post-independence nation. Right? There is, of course, experimentation with cinematic form and aesthetics, especially people like Kumar Shahani and Mani Kaul, who completely focused on the form rather than on the narrative. Of course, austerity, because they were not being financed by a studio or a big production house. The money was always less in these films. I mean, it's ridiculous if you know how much money is being was spent on these films. It's ridiculously low. So they really had to innovate uh, when making these films. And they had, they had rejected the idea of stardom, so there were no stars. Many of the times the, uh, they worked with non-actors and only like one actor who can act, but many of them would be non-actors. Uh, people from the village or whatever town they are filming in pulled into the film. Um, there was also on-location shoots, so there is no use of studio sets, etc. So most of these films relied on on-location shoots. Many of them shot gorilla style without permissions, etc. On streets, uh, you know, with a very small crew of two, three people, right? Uh, yes. So these are the major features, and you will see all of these features in the films that we will watch uh, in the next two days. And coming to the Canada New Wave. Uh, very interestingly, Canada New Wave precedes Girish Kasavali, of course. Uh, and in 1969, was uh, while uh, FFC had funded those four films that we saw, we also had our own uh, Samskara, a film made by Pathavi Ramaradi, uh, which was an adaptation of a novella by Yuvar Anand Murthy. Right? Um, so uh, this is, of course, uh, uh, again, uh, a classic done, uh, it has a cinematographer who, uh, who was from America, Patavi Ramaradi was a poet who went on to direct a film. Uh, his wife acted in it, you know, Girish Karnad wrote the screenplay. So there's all these kind of Renaissance artists, so to say, who were doing many other things other than just film, uh, became part of these kind of uh, films. And to, because they wanted to tell this story and wanted to engage with uh, the, the new Especially in Karnataka, there was a lot of engagement with the modernist literary movements. This was the time when Navya uh, was the Navya movement in literature, Karnataka literature was taking place, where there is there was an emphasis on critically examining Kannada society from within. So you know, sort of uh, so like for example, your Anantamurti's many of his works critically examined the Brahmin orthodoxy uh, and uh, critiqued it in a very interesting way in his stories and novellas. Right. So this was one. There was Vamsharipsha based on a novella by S. L. Bhairapa. This was directed by Girish Karnad. Um, Vishnu Vardhan made his debut in this. People will not know because he later on went on to become commercial star but he worked first in this film. Uh, next. Yeah, Choman Dudi. Choman Dudi is also important for our uh, event because uh, Girish Kasavali uh, assisted B.V. Uh, Karant on this film. B.V. Karant is a famous uh, Canada theatre director uh, who was also head of NSD. Uh, he wanted to uh, you know, translate or adapt Shivram Karant's famous novel Choman Dudi into uh, a film. And uh, this is what came out of it. It's again a classic. Uh, uh, the story itself is so strong that whatever you might miss cinematically is covered up by the story's intensity. It's a story of a uh, lower caste uh, uh, land laborer who doesn't have his own land and his only goal in life is to have his piece of land. 
Right. So as I said, so the, all these, uh, even Abhachurina post office was written by Purnachandra Tejasvi, Kuempu son and uh, poet and uh, novelist. Uh, and uh, this was, these, all these films, as you can see, were adapting literature. It seemed like the Kannada literature movement was uh, in full force. So uh, the primacy of the text came from these uh, literatures, literature, and the film became more or less the secondary uh, vision to these ideas that this literature was putting forward, right? Uh, so, yeah, and this is when we come to our uh, man, Girish Kasarwali. Girish Kasarwali was born in the village called Kasarwali uh, in uh, Malnadu, uh, which many of you will know is uh, Shimoga district. Uh, so it's the Tirthali Thaluk is where he was born. Uh, and uh, he completed a degree in B-Farm in Manipal. Uh, and he, come, he came from an agriculture, he comes from an agricultural family, uh, so we no real, uh, what you say, uh, film culture or artist culture or anything of that kind, but he was very influenced uh, by his uncle. His uncle was K.V. Subana, who uh, founded Nina Sam, as many of you will know. Uh, so uh, along with that, so after his B-Form degree, he went on to FTII, complete his direction course there and then came out and uh, during his course only he had assisted uh, 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 Karan Tonchoman Dudi, as I told you. Uh, his, his, actually his diploma film, which we wanted to show, let's hope we can find that 20 minute slot where we can slow it, uh, called Avashesha, which is a Hindi film, um, um, he, which was his graduation film in FTI, actually won the best short film award uh, uh, at the national level. So from his very first film he made, Girish was right uh, amongst the awards and laurels. Okay? Yeah, so I'll just run you through his filmography, which you might not know. The first film, Ghata Shraddha, which is his debut feature film, which is what we are going to watch today, uh, now, is, uh, is a 1977 film. Again, an adaptation of uh, Yuvar Anant Murthy's short story called Ghata Shraddha. Ghata Shraddha in English means excommunication or rather the ritual of excommunication, excommunicating someone from a caste or a community. Right? Uh, then he made Akramana, uh, which is an urban film, uh, which is less watched. Uh, the print also which is available is quite not so great, but it's a very interesting film. Uh, then again, uh, less watched and the print which does not exist is Muru Darigalu, based on Ashwan Chittal's uh, novel, uh, we, we actually don't have a print of it. So uh, it speaks a lot about our archives and country as a practice of storage. Uh, and uh, Tabrana Kate was um, based on, again, Purnachandra Tejasvi's uh, novel. It's about, uh, it's about uh, this old man who is a government, uh, um, what do you say, peon, who is waiting for his pension and it never seems to come. So it's about the Indian bureaucracy and the the problems with it, right? Uh, and uh, Bandar Vesha, again a film whose print we don't have, uh, is a film he made about uh, Yakshagana and uh, the, how the mask of uh, theat theatrical form like Yakshagana takes over the artist and it gets into this philosophical debate of who is the artist, is the artist the art or, you know, like that. And then uh, Money, which was uh, made with NFDC, Unfortunately, we uh, don't have the Canada print available, but the Hindi print Ek Ghar is there with NFDC. Uh, Nasiruddin Shah and Deepti Naval starred in it, again an urban film. Um, then Krauria. Krauria uh, is 1996. Thai Saiba is 1997. Thai Saiba we are showing today evening. Um, uh, again, uh, as you will see, many of these films have female protagonists, as you're seeing posters going down. Uh, then 2001 Dwipa was about, uh, was an examination of the modern ideas of development and do they mean, uh, do they include everyone or is there an exclusion? So it kind of looked at this indigenous family which lives in the forest and they are being asked to move because a dam is being built. Uh, we are not showing that film, so I'm telling you the story. So <laughs> Hasina is a is a, a film again, which uh, is an adaptation of story by Bhanu Mushtaq's uh, story. Bhanu Mushtaq is a Kannada writer. Uh, it's a story of a Muslim wife whose uh, you know husband uh, is upset that she's not able to bear a male child. So it looks uh, into the again 
uh, insider view of the you know, Muslim community and the problems the women face within that community. Nine Erlu, probably uh, a much favorite film. Many people ask me why are we not showing Nine Erlu. Nine Erlu is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, based on a novel by S.L. Bhairappa. It's uh, about uh, reincarnation or belief in reincarnation. So uh, it's, uh, you know, this couple suddenly are told that a young man is the son reborn. So the widow, they force the widow to accept this new young boy as the new husband. Uh, and when she finally accepts, they are not okay with it. So there is a certain kind of, uh, so this very complicated narrative, very complex film. Um, Gulabi Talkies we'll be seeing tomorrow morning. We are screening it tomorrow morning. Uh, it's a response to, many of these films are responses to what was happening uh, in India at that time. Gulabi Talkies is a response to the rise of communalism in coastal Karnataka in 1990s. Uh, and it's set in Kundapur and uh, has uh, even the dialect of Kundapur. Kundapur. Um, we'll also be showing Kanasemba Kudre and Neri, uh, which is uh, in English, how do you st the stallion of the dream, I think. The stallion of the dream, right? Riding the stallion of the dream. Yeah, so that's the, the English translation of it. It's again based on a story uh, by Amaresh Nugudoni, a North Karnataka based writer. It looks at this belief of grave diggers and uh, how they have a premonition of who has died in the village and the story is set around the grave digger. And Kurma Matara, uh, also something we are showing tomorrow, uh, is, uh, uh, is, is a 2011 film and uh, it really examined the, uh, you know, the, the relevance of Gandhi and his ideals uh, in a post-globalized India through the story of this uh, clerk who is suddenly, because of his resemblance to Gandhi, is asked to play the character of Gandhi in a TV serial. Uh, so yeah, so this is all we are showing. Uh, but this is his latest film, which unfortunately hasn't released yet. It was shown in uh, 2020 uh, Bangalore International Film Festival. But after that, for some reason, the producer hasn't decided yet to release it. So we don't know if he'll get a commercial release. Uh, yeah, so this is there's totally 15 fic fiction feature films uh, Girish made, uh, and uh, yeah, and few documentaries also. And out of these 15, he has won. Uh, you know, the all of them have won awards, but the the Golden Lotus, which is a Surna Kamal, which is awarded to the best Indian feature film every year by the National Film Awards, uh, he has won four times, or four of his films have won those awards. Right? So a little bit about uh, Ghata Shraddha, um, uh, with the film we are going to see now. Um, Ghata Shraddha, yeah, I'm not going to tell the story, just, just introducing it, that's all. <laughs> It's set. Uh, it's set in a in a in a in the Malnadu region, of course, and uh, there's a story of a young woman who's uh, who's uh, who's a young young widow, and uh, the uh, the the tussles of her, the fight struggles of her with the Brahmin orthodoxy because she is her, her father is a, is a priest, so she lives in a agrahara, what we call uh, in Kannada agrahara, which is like a Brahmin colony. Uh, right, so so that's uh, uh, and Gadashada. Of course, the great news about Gadashada is that uh, Gadashada is being restored as we speak by uh, uh, the and funded by none other than George Lucas. So it was uh, it was selected as uh, one of the top Indian films to be restored. Um, uh, so it has been the restoration is being funded by George Lucas of the Star Wars fame. If you don't know. Uh, so, uh, uh, and uh, Film Heritage Foundation uh, is, uh, and Martin Scorsese's Film Restoration Foundation is sort of chaperoning this whole project. They've already restored a couple of films of G. Arvindan in Mayalam, and so they've chosen few Indian films as the films worth restoring. Um, so, Gadashida is one of them. I'll just read a statement by them because they wanted me to tell you all about this. Film Heritage Foundation is proud to announce yet another collaboration with Martin Scorsese's The Film Foundation's World Cinema Project to restore Girish Kasavali's landmark Kannada film Ghada Shraddha. The decision to restore Ghada Shraddha is in line with Film Heritage Foundation's policy to restore hidden gems of Indian cinema and to showcase them to contemporary audience. Um, 
uh, the Gatashadda was chosen as a, during the Indian centenary, which was uh, 100 years of Indian cinema. Gatashadda was chosen as the 10 great Indian art house films and also the 20 all time great Indian films. Um, and uh, it is a matter of great pride that Film Heritage Foundation's proposal to restore Gata Shraddha has been accepted by World Cinema Project. And the funding for the restoration will be provided by Hobson Lucas Family Foundation, helmed by renowned filmmaker George Lucas and his wife, Melody Hobson. The restoration will be done at Lemaji in Ritrovata in Bologna, Italy, one of the, one of the only and the best restoration labs in the world. Uh, the source uh, film for the restoration is the original camera negative, which is, at, which is uh, preserved at National Film Archives of India. Um, yes, so yes, so that's, the, that's a little bit about, uh, so Gatashadda, enjoy. It's about one hour, 45 minutes, I think. Uh, uh, and uh, as I said, it demands an audience collaboration, participation. These are not films which will tell you loudly what is happening. So please engage with it. We'll have Girish uh, at the end of the film to answer any questions you'll have about this film in specifically. Thank you so much. Uh, this might here, uh, sir. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, this might be little specific. So, uh, can you talk to us about uh, like I'm trying to talk about some technical. So, can you talk about uh, the lighting that is used? Like, so how much of lighting is used? Is it uh, uh, equal to today's studio standards, or uh, did shooting in black and white help you with you know shooting in day and then converting that to night? Uh, <coughs> you see, those were the days when uh, uh, these lights were not there. We had to use sun guns for all the shots and the entire film was shot with sun guns and uh, some junior tungsten bulbs, you know. These uh, lights came much later. Which one? The uh, power and all these things. So those were the days when, you know, one had to do entire lighting with sun guns. Uh, that's why one could see some, you know, um, harsh shadows some places. We couldn't have avoided that at all. In today's lighting, you know, you don't have that kind of problem at all. It's easy to bounce the light. Yeah. What is the other question? Well, I think it really helped the film a lot, the black and white. Uh, it uh, enhanced the mm, tragedy of uh, Yamanaka's life in a way. You know. Because, uh, see, color gives you more uh, dimensions in the sense, you know, you can play with colors and all that. But with black and white, we have to play only with the sh sh shadows and lights and, you know, uh, that that really helped me a lot. You know, the white and black and uh, the, even the Malnad houses, they have a lot of blacks in between. You know? And blacks in a way helps you to mount the tragedy. In color, you would have lost that. Yeah. Um, um, my grand aunt had something similar uh, happen, but it was in the context of um, like because she was a child widow, giving her my father in um, adoption to her so that uh, if at all a dosha ittorge, and the satok bhattare, then they tie in that. So maltai court put to untan re, you get back a dosha hotu gatte in that. Then um, she really suffered, and a lot of that suffering I could see. But also she did have a lot of those good moments, like when she would let's say get idli to us or have this ball that oh you know what I'm actually your grandmother, not your grandmother because of the ritual that you've been given to me instead so that, you know, your parents don't die due to astrology or whatever as a child widow. So, um, I kind of was feeling like, what were the joys of Yamanaka? Like, I, th there was one moment when she slept on the lap of the guy and then there were these fle fleeting few moments, but um, I kind of felt like the, in the focus of the tragedy, like, 
what were those feministic joys that she faced or was yeah, it one should yeah. one should uh, you should realize that this is happening in 1940s when the society was very rigid <coughs> and in that society she could uh, you know venture out and uh, you know have a relationship with a man that itself was a major uh, you know this one and uh, well after that she's had to suffer a lot that's true but at the same time we also we should also appreciate that she had the courage to you know go out and develop a relationship with a man you know. so for me that's a bold step that she has taken you see thank you for an extraordinary film it was truly brilliant and i think it has been helped a lot by the extraordinary casting how did you manage to find those perfect people mm. <laughs> well you know that's a part of the game you know you have to look around for right kind of faces because as we go on writing the script the all the characters get chiseled out in our mind you know and we look start looking for such kind of faces and uh, nani is from ninasam the boy who played nani is from ninasam i saw him in a play and really liked him you know so i and then shastri is from bangalore and i had seen him in theater and the remaining uh, all the remaining characters are all from you know uh, none of them are really professional actors Yamuna Matka was actually the student of Dr. U. R. Anantamurthy. Uh, I was still struggling to find the right kind of face, and uh, then uh, I told Anant Anantamurthy, asked me, "Who am, whom have you cast for Yamuna Matka's role?" I said, "I don't have anyone right now because my first choice was Mita Patil." <laughs> What had happened, you know, like uh, <clears throat> my batchmate uh, Samar Nakhate. Uh, i had sent a word through him that time she was acting in uh, jabbar patel's jaitre jait and summer was the associate director she said uh, she can't accept the offer because it's clashing with the the dates problem then i was telling my cameraman i am looking for a <coughs> artist with slightly oval face face and uh, we couldn't find the right face then uh, when i was explaining this to dr yarant murthy he told me why don't you have a look at one of my students when he when i met her i realized this is the right face she had no experience at all of acting she is not even a kannada speaking girl she is a kurgi and uh, but uh, everything gelled well her name is meena kuttappa just meena, for yeah. yeah hello um well, yeah right. i i just want to say that this is one of the best cinematic experiences i've had so thank you so much for making this film um and uh my question is that uh there's a restoration of the film by the martin scorsese foundation and i just wanted to know how that came about and uh yeah i also wanted to know more about how this was your directorial debut and um i feel like you already had a voice a very clear voice and I I just like to know more about that. Um thank you. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> Shivendra Singh Dungarpur who's uh, running this film heritage foundation had seen the film and liked it very much. He wanted this film to be restored. So the one day he approached me would you be interested? I said go ahead because as such the film is in a uh, the negative was in a very bad shape. Uh, the uh, the film was salvaged because of PK Nair who was uh, the Uh, director of uh, national film archive at that time what had happened was this film was processed here in chamundeshwari studio and soon after this they closed down the lab and they asked us to take away the negatives my producer is basically a, has a small uh, uh, what is it uh, automobile paint shop in jj uh, just opposite jj hospital in mumbai he took the negative and kept it there in the <laughs> you know in the paint shop one day when i visited him i told him you know negatives have to be kept in the under uh, storage you know proper storage condition then he handed it over to another studio there since it is not their project 
they dumped it near the you know <laughs> toilet so somebody who went there saw the negative lying there near the toilet he came and reported that to me then immediately i wrote to um, mr pk nair and told him you know this is and he had liked the film very much so he immediately shifted all the negatives by then two reels have been spoiled you know he got it converted from the print you know duped the whole thing that's why the sound quality is so bad uh, so the uh, sound sound quality was so bad and i was a bit shocked to the, hear the sound it was playing with the full uh, you know <laughs> volume they should have reduced it by one or two steps uh, stops it uh, sound shouldn't be so loud actually <laughs> uh, uh, keep that in mind while while projecting the next films <laughs> remaining films and then it was uh, uh, shivendra singh took the film project and then showed it to martin scorsese and uh, george lucas they both liked it and since the negative is totally damaged they had to both of them had to chip in their uh, resources and uh, now it has started even if they are still struggling with the sound uh, because i told them that we had only four prints and uh, out of the four prints two have been totally damaged so now you look for the remain because it had won quite a few awards in the international circuit so i told them these are the awards and write to them if they have the copy you can get it back they don't uh, they couldn't so now they are trying to remix the sound and create it you know mm. yeah. yes Uh, oh. one second sir. just a second yeah hmm. <laughs> yeah i had the impression when watching the film that the characters were either good or bad or perpetrators or victims and they seemed to be quite extreme on Polarized. both sides huh. was i right in my impression uh and if i was if i am right Why did you decide to have it be like that instead of having be characters which were more nuanced or more convoluted or more things in a gray area? Yeah, in fact, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, uh, during those days, you know, were, actually, if you know the socio-political situation of Karnataka, you know, that was the time when low heights were very strong and they were very strong against where they were up against the caste system in uh, in in the in the nation. as opposed to marxists so uh, all these writers took their uh, this one against the caste system itself especially the brahmin brahminical hierarchical order brahminical rigidity and brahminical so i um, used that uh, kind of insight while making this film you know so it was more uh, towards the uh more for the characters and less for the community you know so that's why i had to make this kind of this one the boy looks really villainish i know whereas uh, the bond between um, emunaka and nani becomes stronger and stronger one of the things why i uh, what i liked in the story it, the, the structure of the story itself you know that way the uh, the the story had a very beautiful structure it had uh, these kind of you know uh, diametrically opposite things playing right through the story you have uh, characters like emunaka who is uh, uh, who sees a kind of a uh, this one in nani and uh, for nani she becomes a motherly uh, you know uh, character and what he does in the first half of the film it's yamunaka who protects nani in the second half of the film it's nani who protects yamunaka and uh, nani becomes becomes uh, kind of a slightly an adult this one which is not a very uh, welcome this one because it's not a natural it's a forced uh, he's forced to take up the job uh, the responsibility and uh, then all if you understand the social structure of Indi karnataka or uh, india you understand all kinds of uh, relationship are there you know mother son and uh, two kinds of uh, the the ostracism by the uh, society by the religious and by the society between katira and nani katira is outcast and nani is upper caste and uh, you have all that kind of you know binary divisions in the society and that's all there in the film 
So in order to highlight that, I made this kind of a structure, you know, wherein you have this kind of binary divisions, you know, good versus evil. Yet, you know, the, uh, the evil in the Western sense is, doesn't exist in the film. Even when um, I depict uh, na the Shastri, the boy who uh, rags him all the time, I try to explain why he is so. He says, you know, that's because of his upbringing, it's because of the way how the society looks at him. So it's not the boy per se is bad, but then it's the society which makes him sad, which makes him uh, bad. He's evil. an orphan. He's an orphan in the film, you know. So all that kind of uh, relationship was there in the world, in the uh, film, which I thought uh, the structurally the story is very good. And I highlighted that, you know, in the film itself. Yeah, you wanted to ask you something. Excuse me. Sir, Namaskara. Hello. Ah, yeah. uh, film Tumba Chanak. Okay, I'll speak in English. Uh, I really, uh, I'm in awe of the cinematography, mm. perform performances, and sound yeah. score. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. So, uh, I want to know from you since a lot of time has elapsed. What do you feel about uh, watching this film now? Uh, how much has changed and how much has not changed? Uh, yeah. The filmmaking has changed, but not the societal structure. You know? <laughs> it may not be as hostile as uh, that is there in the film, uh, but uh, things haven't changed much. It has changed uh, quite a lot in Karnataka, but in India it hasn't. If you look at if you look at the, some of the states in the northern part of India, the <coughs> caste structure is is very, very, you know, suffocating. Social structure is, although, you know, it's not at all good, not at all conducive to any kind of progressive ideas. So things have not changed much. Mm, yeah. So it's very disheartening and mm. disorienting to me. Yeah. <clears throat> Even in our villages, they still use the same thing, you know. Uh, such uh, they can't they can openly call them you know, holeyas. They they, they 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 know that you know any they can be prosecuted by that, but they still use some kind of a sliding you know uh, remarks about these castes and things. Attitude wise, it has, hasn't changed much. Yeah. I have too many questions, but I'll limit it to one. Um, is it in the custom to shave the women's head who has been excommunicated, or is it shown such for dramatic purposes? Because the reason why I'm asking is, uh, as far as Yamuna's character, uh, Yamunaka character is concerned. I find it more courageous that she chooses abortion more than, you know, seeking out a relationship, going out, uh, meeting a man. So I just feel she's being punished more, uh, mm -hmm. more than being, you know, uh, excommunication itself is a, a severe punishment uh, on her part and uh, showing her with a shaved head seems a kind of a bit uh, severe to me. So is it in the custom that you wanted to bring it out or? It's Is not it there in the custom, but I wanted to uh, you know, uh, talk about it figuratively. See, see what happens, what is uh, outcasting, what is wrong with her? Because she used her body. Uh, and uh, the, the, one of the problems with the upper caste, this one, is that they are very touchy, uh, they are very, this one, about the touch. Right? So, uh, I got this idea from a book. Uh, I was wondering why in many of the Japanese uh, samurai films, they always, you know, the uh, Japanese women, we see them with, uh, you know, uh, eyebrows shaven and head shaven and all that. 
I got an explanation that they want to disfigure her so that she doesn't look. They also remove the teeth, teeth, uh, so that they don't be, you know, look, um, look up, you know, attractive. That that is the biggest crime one could you know inflict on the women. You know. Uh, so I was looking for some kind of a uh, object to correlate you for that crime. Then I thought this would be better, you know, because uh, just out cost, throwing her out of the society, one who hasn't experienced it doesn't really understand that. You, know. you and me may not believe in caste system at all. So if they throw her as, out as a... They, they, if they throw her, us out of the society, out of the caste, it doesn't matter to us at all. But in a rigid social you know, structure, that is very important. So how do I look, uh, how do I bring this out, this cruelty? When I was thinking of a, a right objective correlate, I thought, why not I use this? Because the moment you see her, Somewhere you get the feeling it's uh, this kind of punishment is, I mean, the punishment itself is wrong, but this is extreme. So uh, that hits you very hard, hits the audience very hard. That, in that sense, it's purely for the impact effect. I know there are several more questions, uh, but we'll have to take a quick break and come back for a more formal conversation. Namaskara, good evening and welcome back. This is the second part of uh, this afternoon, the first day of the retrospective of Girish Kasarwali featuring five of his films. I have to mention that uh, this is part of BIC's new initiative to uh, celebrate auteur cinema made in Karnataka and in India. So it's basically calling all cinephiles uh, to enjoy films that are, have to be uh, savored in a group, in a group setting. And this is a small attempt at uh, perhaps building an informal film club where people come together with uh, shared interests and love of cinema. At uh, B Cinematic, our mission is to curate and share those remarkable films those are a must-watch or re-watch experience for every passionate cinema lover. From groundbreaking classics to underappreciated gems, our carefully curated selection will take you on an unparalleled, pun not intended, cinematic journey through the ages. And we are honored and thrilled that Girish Kasarwali sir has, is our inaugural uh, filmmaker and uh, we kick off this uh, ambitious series with a retrospective celebrating his films. So starting this weekend, every first Sunday of every month, the first Sunday of every month, 11 a.m. if you land up at BIC, you'll have a wonderful film to watch. Now may I uh, invite Basa onto the stage who will engage Girish Karsarwali with in a conversation. This is the first of two conversations planned over today and tomorrow. May, may we also have uh, Girish sir on stage, please. Okay, go, uh, good evening everyone. Thank you for coming, thank you for staying back for this conversation. Hopefully you'll be also staying for the screening later. Um, so uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, sitting with uh, Girish Kasavali here uh, to talk about his cinematic journey, his artistic journey, uh, and his working life as much as we can in this short period of 45 minutes. We'll also, at the end of 40 to 45 minutes, we'll open it up for Q&A, so people who could not ask questions earlier will uh, still have a chance to ask a few questions. Uh, but the intent of this conversation is to talk uh, um, more broadly about his entire work, uh, not just of the films we are watching. Right, uh, so welcome, Girish. Uh, thank you, Vasa. 
Yeah. And thank you, BIC, for organizing this. Uh, to start with, I'll just, uh, I don't know how many of you are there for the initial intro that I did in the afternoon, so I'm just going to do a short bio of Girish. Girish Kasavalli was born in a village called Kasavalli in Tirthali Taluk in Malnadu, which is Shimoga district. Uh, and uh, he studied, his early education was, of course, in the villages nearby, but secondary education was in Shimoga, higher secondary too, and then he did B farm as a graduation in uh, Manipal, and then uh, he went on to do the three-year course in uh, FTII Pune. So that's uh, briefly, and af after that, of course, he, we know that he made films, and we are here because of that. So, uh, so I think to start with, sir, it'll be great if you can, because uh, you hail from a agriculturist family, right? And uh, so you did not come from, let's say, the privilege of the city who had access to cinema at that time. Uh, he was born in 1950, so I'm trying to uh, frame this question in that respect. So uh, what was your early life like in the village you're born, and what were the sort of uh, I don't know, the engaging entertainment which kept you as a child engaged. And what was it growing up like that? If you could paint us a picture like you do beautifully with your films, it would be nice to know how was your early life. Yeah. <clears throat> the film Gatshada was shot in my own house. So you know that, <laughs> what kind of a house is it and uh, where is it located? Quite isolated in Malnadu. The houses are far and wide, you know, it's, one has to travel quite a lot to see another house. So I was born and brought up in a place like that. Uh, and uh, during those days, we used to have heavy rains till November, December, from Jan June to November, December. So heavy. You know, Agumbe is very close to my village. Agumbe is the second highest rain falling place in India. So my constant comp companion were the rains, the insects, the you know serpents, such things. You know, so I had to walk quite a lot to go to the school. You know, my school was about five kilometers from away from my house, and nearest uh, film theater was four four hours journey from my house. So I never bothered to. My father didn't never bother to send us for films, though he was very keen on films, you know. Uh, so I wasn't exposed to cinema at all in that sense. The few films that I have seen before I joined FTI were uh, the mythologicals of MTR that were being played in the village touring talkies. One, you know, we used to have these touring talkies visit a small place near our house. Uh, three months, uh, two weeks in a year, and we would watch some two, three films a year, mythologicals, and I was never impressed by those films. Films like Jagadeka, Viruna Katha, Maya Bazaar, and all that, Sadarame, and things like that, Naga Kanike. So, <clears throat> somehow I, never, I was never interested in films. It's after I passed out from the College of Pharmacy, Manipal. Uh, by then, my uncle had joined FTII and did a course in uh, film appreciation course. We were all surprised. He was considered to be a very important poet, a very important thinker, and Max later he won Max Essay Award also. And we were all surprised, why did he go to a film school? After all, film is a low art. That was the impression we had. Then he told us, uh, he gave me some books and he said, uh, Film is probably the most important act, uh, art of our time, art, arts of our time. This is uh, K.V. Subarna. K.V. Subarna. And then, you know, my interest grew and then uh, I casually applied because I wanted to do my, my M pharmacy. But I applied, I got selected, and then, of course, I forgot pharmacy and continued filmmaking. My stay at FTI, Film and Television Institute uh, in Pune, was some was a period where I changed my attitude towards life, my towards art, and that was a golden period in my life. You know, we watched three films a day for three years, and that changed my uh, 
perception of film and my attitude towards cinema developed. And we had very good teachers like Professor Sotish Bahadur and Neerad Mahapatra. Yeah, uh, just a little bit will take a step back again, not go till FTI, but if you reflect on your early childhood, like I, uh, I was very curious as to with the time you had in the evenings and also since the houses were distant, I'm assuming there are not much friends and playing and all that kind of activity. So, and you were also in a time where uh, if, if we think of it as the late 50s or early 60s, there's a lot of churn in the society, especially there, with all kinds of social movements, etc. So, and your father was a freedom fighter who participated in the freedom fighting. So I wanted to understand, do, if you look back now, do you see any sort of, uh, you know, if you, can you articulate any kind of inflection points which kind of had an influence on you? What kind of activities or thoughts? Well, um, <clears throat> So once we are back from the school, we had no friends. There was no possibility of meeting anyone other than the family members. So we were all immersed in books, you know, Canada, uh, novels, short stories, and things like that. So that was the foundation I received. A lot of uh, uh, good grounding on Canada literary scenario. I was exposed to the works of, uh, say, Shivram Koranth, even when I was, uh, even while I was studying, and I, that's how I came in contact with the Navya movement also, you know, of uh, the works of uh, <coughs> uh, Chital and uh, Ashwan Chital and your Anant Murthy and all these people. Apart from literature, the only other influence which we had, only the other attraction we had was the Yakshagana. And Yakshaganas normally would visit remote villages only during summer. So we would wait for summer, yeah. Melas. Melas, so that we could get to see the kind of performances. Apart from that, no other so-called, within quotes, entertainment at all. And uh, uh, there's nobody to even to play, you see. <laughs> so I never uh, played anything in the, my childhood, you know. Uh, so I didn't know what is cricket, I didn't know what is volleyball or badminton and things like that which all I got some kind of a this one once we shifted to Shimoga where I studied. I was there for about three years. That's uh, how my, that's, that's uh, this one. Well, you asked me about uh, influences. Yes, my father was a, though he was a big zamindar, but uh, he was in the Congress movement, freedom movement, and he was a great Gandhian. And my mother's father was also a Gandhian. So that kind of a influences was there during my childhood, you know. All these kind of idealisms, of Gandhian idealisms of, you know, Harijan Dhar and, you know, the village development and uh, b trying to bring scientific, uh, you know, spirit into the village, mind of the villagers. Uh, that's something uh, I got uh, inculcated into my mind during my childhood because of my father and my grandfather. Why did you choose bee farm? I'm just curious. <laughs> <laughs> See, I actually wanted to, my father wanted me to do medicine. I was uh, fairly good at studies, so I, but I didn't get the kind of, uh, what is it, numbers, uh, so that, uh, marks, so that I could uh, get into any of the medical colleges. Then one of my uncles suggested, why don't you join B pharmacy. That time nobody had heard about B pharmacy. And since it is something to do with medicines and medical profession, I joined. Uh, and th that's the only reason why I. Once I joined uh, B pharmacy, well, I studied there for four years, passed out with a distinction, then I wanted to do M pharmacy. And meanwhile, this thing happened. You know. Yeah. And uh, if we look at, uh, you know, if you try to remember the books you read, etc., was your bent, uh, because all of these books at that time, the writing of Navya movement especially, were deeply influenced by the socialist mm -hmm. ethos, so to say, right? So the, there was a lot of uh, ideological push through the, even through the fiction uh, that was being written or poetry being written, written in that region especially. So was your attraction to the the plot, the narrative, the characters, or was it more ideological since you had, uh, you know, also considering your family was involved in Gandhian struggles, etc.? 
Uh, see, I am from Tirthali. Tirthali is the uh, this one for socialist movement. You know, Gopal Gada was there, Kardal Manjappa from you know uh, this one was there, Sadashiva was there, and all uh, major writers of that time, st starting from Anand Murthy, Lankesh, they are all socialists. So, and K V Subbanna is a big uh, you know influence on me. He was a socialist thinker and. Uh, so that helped me a lot in uh, you know you know formulating my ideas about the structure of the society and things like that. But I would say <clears throat> it's the Kannada literature which shaped my aesthetic sensibilities more than any of these things, you know. And uh, the socialist ideas, as it percolated down to me through the works of. Anantamurthy and uh, Shivaram Karant and uh, Lankesh and all this, and Kevish Subbanna. Yes. So, I mean, uh, you are so influenced by reading and you didn't have much access to cinema. You had access to Yakshagana uh, or some theatre performance uh, arts. So if we think of it, uh, why did you not, say, try to write or become writer? Or how did you transfer or shift from, say, world of words the world of images, what was that sort of turning point? Uh, to understand that we need to, yes, boss, there is here. Uh, to understand that we need to uh, see the socio-political situation of uh, 60s, the movements of 50s, 60s. You know, uh, 1960s was the Canada Navia movement started. It was uh, started with people like, you know, Mm, Anand Murthy and Salankesh, and it was in full sp spirit around that time. So literature and Gopal Krishnadika and uh, yeah. Gokak and all these people, that was the influence on literature. And then with painting, of course, yes, like people like S.G. was there, you know, <laughs> brought in a new kind of sensibilities into Canada painting and that also. And then B.V. Karan came down to Bangalore and the, there was a new movement in Canada theatre, you know. And uh, Subbanna started expanding that, and you know, that was the time when you know I thought uh, since I couldn't write, I was not good with you know language. So I thought I should uh, try my hand somewhere else, and I thought why not I try cinema? You know, because cinema, I had some kind of a fascination for cinema without realizing the, its potential, right? Because as I told you earlier, I was not at all influenced by the mythologicals, but I somewhere realized it has a kind of a potential. The books that K.V. Subbanna lent me, I read those books. One of them was, hmm? what those books? one is uh, Barno Krishna Swami's History of Indian Cinema, which is which give me kind of a uh, insight into what is. The other is film art by and Pudokin's books, and uh, th those are, of course, I can't say that I really understood all those uh, theoretical uh, concepts. But I realized, you know, there's something, they're s saying something different. Then what happened in 1969, Samskara uh, came out, you know. Uh, not the novel, I'm talking about the film. Okay, yeah. And in 70, it was released. And uh, I must confess that when I went to see the film, it didn't impress me at all. But uh, when yeah, you, it was released in Shimoga also? It was released in Shimoga. But I was at the time uh, studying in um, Manipal. So when I come down for the vacation, it was running in the theater. I went to see the film and uh, I was exposed only to popular genre films. So it didn't impress me at all. But then I was wondering why is it everyone is prizing that film? So I went and saw it again. You know. It's only on successive viewings I realized the significance of the film. And even today, I'd say Samskara is one film which, uh, in Canada, from Canada, which influenced me a lot. Even today, whole <coughs> even today I like it. Uh, Had you then, read the story by then? The by then I had read the novel, yes. Yeah, novel, yeah. Okay, yeah. And then, of course, after I joined FTI, you know, my I got a clear picture of what is cinema and what is art, or what is the purpose of cinema and all that. You know. So uh, usually when we talk to 
artists or filmmakers. So there is a little bit of a, an arc, you know, you start somewhere and you go somewhere, you reach a peak and you sort of, so there's something like that, right? But uh, with you, what is uh, fascinating is that it seems like even with your diploma film, you had sort of by then figured out how you want to approach film art. Right, it seemed there was no, I mean, there was no, it seemed like, I mean, if we take some features of your films, there is no didactic uh, treatment at all, right? And there is, uh, when you consider dialogue, it's very minimal, economical, right? And there is a focus on images speaking more than, you know, uh, something being told via dialogue. Right. So there is uh, some of these things, sort of, and there is a forensic precision when we look at mise en scene of your films. Like no object or no actor is in the in the frame. Is uh, uh, nobody is there who is not supposed to be there. Right. So it's like the, the, there is no sort of lose. What do you say that thing? Even in the diploma film, there seems to be a certain kind of. Uh, so. How did that happen in three years? Because there are many FTI people who have gone through those three years. But it seemed like you figured out this, how you want to approach filmmaking within those three years. And that's why Avasesha, of course, mm. the F Diploma Film won award as well and is still much praised even now. Um, so I'm very curious, how did that happen? Because usually filmmakers go through some kind of uh, you know, bumps till they get their voice, so to say. Yeah. Uh, no, you see, uh, in uh, uh, Film and Television Institute of India, Pune, for three years we were uh, told, uh, analyzed, uh, you know, deconstructed various kinds of films, and then uh, uh, I never missed any classes. I never, I didn't miss any class because I would go there and sit there with professors and try to understand what they are trying to say, and compare that with what is happening in my. Canada literary scene, everyone things like that. And somewhere I developed my uh, my sense of cinema in the very beginning itself. You know, all these qualities which you said. You know, the sen you know <clears throat> the mise scene and its construction, the importance of it, and all that. But fortunately, we were uh, uh, very fortunate to have self, such good teachers like Professor Satish Bahadur and. Nirad Mahapatra. Nirad Mahapatra was a great influence on all of us. Um, and then, of course, uh, in FTA, apart from these few selected uh, teachers, the rest were not, uh, they were like very technicians. You know, they were not very keen on aesthetics and things like that. But it is our seniors, when we were conversing, you know, we, got, we got a lot of feedbacks, you know, what to see, what to see. Like, you see, when I saw, Wild service for the first time, it went about my above my head. I didn't understand why is it praised so much. It's then you know we go to various seniors and then ask them why is it so good and all that. Then they would explain, and that's how. And, and I must say I really utilized that three years stint at FTI in a very you know useful way, fruitful way. But uh, you know FTI the environment we all know is very. Fiery. There is a lot of discussion, argument, fighting, the whole wisdom, wisdom tree, legends, and all that. And you are a very quiet, reserved man. So how did, how was your sort of? Uh, I was a listener all the time. <laughs> See, in Film and Television Institute of India, in the center of the campus, there is a tree. It's called Wisdom Tree. There is a this one around that, you know. And people would come there. Whoever comes there, they would sit there and start uh, sermonizing about films. So whoever is free would go and sit there and listen to it. People like Manikal would come there, Kumar Shani would come there, Manal Sen would come there. So it was a great opportunity for us to go and you know interact with them. So that is, uh, if, you know, and all our seniors, whenever, see it is right opposite to the canteen. So they would just pick up a cup of coffee or tea, sit there, and then start talking about cinema. So we talked about cinema from morning, evening, day, night, and 24 hours a day. That way, um, Film Institute ambience. 
And there were these also factions, the Ray faction versus Ghatak faction. And yeah, that is there in all, all film <laughs> schools. <laughs> yeah. You always have, you know, in fact, my batch was considered to be the worst batch because we always talked about Satyajit Ray, Kurosawa, and Bergman. And these are the three filmmakers whom the other seniors would dismiss. Them. They would say, they always talk about Godard, Bresson, and uh, Misoguchi, on the contrary, and Ghatak. And we would, uh, on the contrary, Choose all the other, you know, like we won't talk about Gatak, we would talk about Ray, we won't talk about Mizoguchi, but we would talk about Kurosawa, we won't talk about uh, uh, Godard, but we would prefer uh, a man like Bre, you know, Bergman. So they branded us as the you know, very weak, most weak, weakest, uh, what is it, batch. And later it turned out that in, from our batch, you know, there were five filmmakers who made very big, made it very big. And two of them turned out to be Padma Shri's, you know. <laughs> yeah, including Girish. Girish won Padma Shri in 2010. No, Manmohan Mahapatra is there. Manmohan Mahapatra made quite a few films. I think he made eight films, and all the eight films have won national awards. And then, you know, he had his own style of filmmaking. Unfortunately, he died at a very young age. Then, of course, Janu Barwa is there. Then, you know, Chitrarth Singh is there. Chandita Mukherjee yeah. recently passed away. They're all my batchmates, you know, Ketan Mehta. <laughs> yeah. And which, if you remember, I don't know, what, what were some films which, since there are many young people here, what were some of those world cinema films which had a huge influence on you and you said, huh, that's my aesthetic or that's my style? In fact, uh, I had heard about... Uh, uh, the works of Ray, but had never seen, had never the opportunity to see his films. So, in every day, they would screen two films and they never showed uh, Ray for about 15 days. My batchmate who had seen Ray, he would watch each, every film and come out and say, no, 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 this is not a film. You must watch Pather Panchali. It's the greatest film. So I used to wonder, what is this film? Then, after 15 days, we were shown this Pathir Panchal, and we were still blown over, blown over by that. Uh, but my favorite were Ozu, Yasujiro Ozu of Japan, Michelangelo Antonini of Italy, and Bergman. I am Could you never say impressed. Why? Could you say I, was, I was never impressed by Hollywood. And I never watched, even today, my knowledge of uh, Hollywood and Bollywood is big zero. Uh, but I, knowledge of uh, European cinema is quite strong, and knowledge of Asian cinema is very strong. Why I like Antonini, I'll tell you, is one filmmaker whose mise-en-scene is, mise is so precise that it's impossible to shift any shot from the, you know, uh, you don't even see that kind of a competency, that kind of the, this control even in the works of, say, Bergman. Hmm? But the kind of uh, <clears throat> human uh, mind, human persona they etch out on the screen is something amazing, you know. That's one of the reasons why I like all these filmmakers. More than concepts, it's the nature of the man. I was interested in. Yeah. That's the reason why Lanath is my favorite, not the Lanventura. Autumn Afternoon is my most favorite film, not the Tokyo Story. And uh, Rashomon is my favorite and not uh, Seven Samurai. This needs a separate debate. Why <laughs> then? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it's great. So, Ozu and so in, in the sense, um, it seems like you know everything is sort of uh, percolated or distilled into you within that whole FTI world. Although you came from uh, this milieu, which didn't have much of access of cinema, etc. And and I think that was that really helped me a lot uh -huh. because I went to FTI like a with a blank slate kind of thing. You know, whatever they showed made an impression because all the others came there with a package. They came with um, some people come with you know. Uh, Raj Kapoor baggage, some people come with Gurudath baggage, some people come with, you know, some uh, uh, Shivaji Ganeshan baggage. I didn't have any baggage. I went there and whatever, you know, was shown in the, in the classroom theatres, I started absorbing them. Yeah. Uh, but when, when you were sort of nearing the end of the course and you wanted to make a film, uh, uh, and uh, because Avashesha has similar tropes, 
what we see in Gatashadda also with respect to this uh, boy and uh, the older uh, person. Uh, is, is, uh, what was it that you, were, you know, sort of, because it's very unusual diploma film, I feel, compared to usually what we see from, you know, young 23, 23 year old FTI graduates making film, because it had, it was looking at the loneliness of an old woman, it was looking at the same time, loneliness of a young boy. Uh, so there is, so how did that happen? Somehow it's there in all my films, you know. Yeah. The othering, the othering of the person is the theme of all my films, whether it is Gulabi or Yamunaka or say Tabara, Thai Saheba. How people get isolated? Why the society isolates some people? Why they make them sound other, the other? And uh, <clears throat> when I was asked to do this, a short fiction film, I was, that was in my mind, you know. Oh, I said it's Avshesh. Avshesh is, means the ruins. It's not the uh, ruins of the house, of the any, you know, architectural space. But what is there between the person, intrapersonal relationship, you know, between the family members, the crumbling relationships of the family members. So I thought I should ha start highlighting these things, you know. The family structure is collapsing, but nobody cares for this old lady or for this young boy. And in that process, these two people become, develop a bonding, you know. So the othering helps other two people bond. Similarly, Yamunaka and Nani bond, develops a bond because both are othered, you know. So this big, that, that, that I think is there in all my films. Although I keep saying, telling, that was not consciously done, but if you look at my films, one of the running theater, running uh, theme of all my films is the way how people alienate, alienate uh, the Say, the society alienates certain people, the community alienates on the, uh, this one of religion, on that pretext of community and the pretext of nation and all that. So it's there in all my films, you know. So that developed while I, I was writing my first film, you know, the short film. And also, I think with with Gharashadda, what we saw already is that we see that there is uh, an interest to tell the larger story of the community or the orthodoxy of the religion, etc., through a particular character's journey without being didactic or without, especially interesting, I find is in all your characters in most of the films, uh, which are alienated, don't seem to ever uh, be able to express that alienation. They seem to be very, uh, uh, they don't know how to express their alienation. So it's, uh, it's something uh, very... See, uh, I won't say they don't express the alienation. They experience the alienation, but then they react in their own way. They are not, as you rightly said, didactic, because I don't want anything to be didactic. Because the moment you didactic, you become didactic, you are trying to say, here is the answer. But I don't want to say that. He says, here is the problem, not the answer. Here is the problem, and you find the answer. So I want, it's a kind of a participatory, you know, like the audience, the viewer also should participate in the process of, in, you know, distilling the message. Not, I won't say message, the content. Uh, that's one of the reasons why none of my films are didactic. None of my films are message oriented. None of them films are preachy. Everything comes to the viewer through experience. And experience is one thing which we trust, you know. We trust, we don't distrust that. But if I am preaching, there are chances where we doubt them. Because what happens when we preach, we somewhere tend to uh, misjudge their sensibilities. We think, you know, they are like students and I am the teacher, I, am a, I have something, you know, upper uh, this one. I don't agree with that. I think, like, let us sit across the table and discuss. You also knowledgeable, I am also knowledgeable of the situation. Let us see what I am, whether you agree with my perspective or not. So that's my, uh, and this is what I have learned in, for three years, looking at all the major uh, 
film makers, you know, they never preached. Bergman never preached anything. See what happens. Even Professor Isaac, you know, he is going to receive the honorary direct, you know, doctorate. But in the end, he realizes he is a failure in the life. You know, these kind of contradictions, all the masters do, you know. So what is, you set out to say, here is a great uh, professor, and in the end, you end up saying that man has realized that he is not all that great. This kind of a self-reflection, reflection, you know, a re a reflectiveness, you know, is something which I try to achieve in my films, which I have learned from all the masters, which I have learned from Canada literary masters. Yeah. So, I mean, would it be fair to then say that you... Uh, in your work, you sort of uh, give primacy to, say, lived experience or because some filmmakers enter films all from an ideological perspective. For example, you know, if you t someone says, you know, I have this Marxist idea, so I'll use fiction to, you know, uh, talk about that ideology, right? And we have had many such filmmakers as well. And uh, some come through a philosophical question of, you know, uh, sometimes Bergman does too. Some enter through philosophical question. But it seems like you enter your, uh, the subject you are dealing with through a, a narration of a lived experience. Is that fair to say? Well, <clears throat> I want my film to, first of all, you know, give a kind of a very, ex you know, I want them to receive the film on an experiential level. From the experience, they should ponder and develop a kind of a philosophical I don't want them to uh, uh, preach them about my political positions. Uh, the, 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 uh, the viewer should get the political uh, nuances by looking at the, uh, the, uh, the characters and things like that. So I don't, I probably I've done one or two films wherein I try to do the other way around. But in most of the cases, uh, it's not, you know, you don't prefix anything and then knit a story around that. No. You let the uh, story evolve. And as the story evolves, when you bring in all your uh, conceptual things into it, this is something, you know, in Indian cinema also, you have these two streams. One is that of Ray, one is that of Mrinal Sen. Right? Mrinal Sen, not a complete Mrinal Sen, up to one stage. Up to one stage. I have no... Uh, the th three, uh, there are three stages in Munal Sen's life, and uh, towards the third phase, it's a mature Munal Sen, you know. But second phase, starting with Brom, not Bone Shom, but from Calcutta 71, it's where uh, he directly tried to address the audience through some kind of a political uh, uh, this one position. But uh, third uh, stage of Munal Sen. It's more philosophical in the sense, you know, he, d he does away with all these kind of a, uh, political, uh, this one, but becomes more internalized. You know, he internalizes and that is for me more important than anything else, you know. Uh. So uh, the other thing I wanted to sort of bring at this point is that uh, you, ch in your selection of the literary work on which your films are based, you are very, uh, what do you say, eclectic, in the sense that although you come from a certain region like Malanadu, you have also adapted stories which are set in North Karnataka, like, uh, you know, Thai Saiba that we are going to watch is set in somewhere in Belgaum or, you know, that milieu, and uh, Kanasamba Kudreneri is set in uh, somewhere again in North Karnataka, then Gulavitakis is set in coastal, uh, coastal Karnataka. So there is a very different, like you, so it seems like, you know, I mean, how do you get to these, this one story. What is your process of saying this is the story I want to make a film on? Uh, and how do you maybe talk a little bit about how do you adapt it to cinema as well? So, uh, when I <clears throat> pick up a story for adaptation, I'm never faithful. I'm not at all faithful to the story. In fact, that's one thing which I uh, did in my first film. Uh, <clears throat> you know, soon after Gattashadda, 
uh, I showed the film to Dr. Yoranand Murthy. What uh, the impression, the his impression uh, was, uh, you know, something it changed my perception of uh, literary adaptation altogether. He said, I really like the film because it is not, it doesn't resemble my story, he said. <laughs> See, to get such a kind of a remark from a, such an established writer is, he says, if, if you just transform the medium, then why should I waste two and a half hours to, no, which I could have read it in half an hour. So you should convert the, in, the, this one into an experience. And that, you know, somehow changed my, per, this one at all, you know, the notion of adaptation. And I changed uh, all my films uh, somewhere, you know, do not uh, uh, resemble the original short story at all. Gulabi Talkies and uh, Nine Erudu are, I go to the other extreme of, you know. <clears throat> See, when I pick up a story, what I, I don't pick up a story and then make a film. There's something, you know, what is happening in the society and the dialogue, you know, it's, it's, it's developing a kind of a dialogue in, your, in, the mind, in my mind. And when I'm thinking about it, you know, I suddenly notice a story this particular story is saying the same thing. Why not I adopt it? You know, that's how I adopt the story. So once I decide that, I look for three, four things in the story. First of all, first thing is that the story should really move me. It shouldn't, be, should, shouldn't become purely cerebral. Not a film of purely ideas, but a film of experience also, a story of experience also. So I look for that. It should have a very conventional arc. You know, <clears throat> there should be a proper beginning. You know, it should gradually build up, and then there should be a denouement and things like that. Many European filmmakers don't follow that, whereas all Asian filmmakers, Latin American filmmakers, they follow this. That's the first uh, thing. Second thing, you know, what I am trying to say, how does it relate to the present? So, is it uh, something to do with the dialogue that is there happening inside my mind? Is it something to do, uh, it, it, does the story talk of something, about something that is bothering me? That's the second thing. So, I, that is, is it relevant to the present day, socio-political situation. If it is relevant only to pre present socio-political, you know, this one, then it becomes newspaper. Next tomorrow it won't make any sense. Then you also look for something which transcends the time. You look for the, whether the subject, the material, does it have the power to transcend it? In uh, Canada, you know, the Anand Puthi uses a beautiful say, Sadhya and Shashwata. Sadhya's today, present. Shashwata means eternal. So, does it really transcend this time barrier and becomes, does the story become universal? So, it has to be local, and but at the same time, it has to be universal. If it doesn't correspond to these two things, I, I don't pick up the thing. Third thing, the fourth one is that, say, not all stories lend itself to cinematic rendering. One has to know that, the director should know this. And does it, can I see cinematic possibility in the story? If I don't see the cinematic possibility, I don't take it up. See, I may not find cinematic possibility in a story, but you might find it, because that depends on our reading and our capacity. So I don't go by your reason. Sometimes people say, this is the great story, you pick it up. I said, I won't, because I can't see cinematic possibilities. What is that cinematic possibility, if you can like, double <laughs> click on thing. that? There's something very difficult, you know. <laughs> can you see the images in the film? Because for me, the cinema starts with the images and ends with the images. While I read the story, if I don't see images, 
I don't pick up the story. When I say images, I don't mean the visual images. I've been saying it quite often. Images are not formed on the screen. Images formed on the minds, mindscape of the viewer. Can I find an equivalent so that it creates an image in the hypothetical viewer? So I, I don't know what happens to your mind, but I think this is how probably Basav would react. So that image is important. So I look for kind of thing. It could be visual image, it could be oral image, it could be an image developed through juxtaposition, it could be through mise-en-scene, it could be through architecture, it could be through acting, it could be through the mere casting. So if I don't, uh, if, it, if the story doesn't, uh, you know, create that kind of impression, I don't even touch that. There are quite a few short stories, novels in Canada, which I've loved, liked, but I have never tried, attempted to do anything. You know? Whereas there are some novels, short stories, which have no literally literary significance at all. But I could make something, you know, substantial film out of it. This one is one, one such an example, Dweepa. So that's how, uh, while I set out to select the story, these are some of the issues that I take into consideration. Uh, great. So this is very interesting to note. I mean, just I'm asking these questions to sort of double click on the formalist kind of uh, talk, which we never have in some such discussions. Uh, the other thing uh, I wanted to ask you is one is that you, how do you even get to know of these books is a question, <laughs> which is the smaller question of it, right? Because say Lokapur is someone who is, Ramsha Lokapur is far removed from the milieu you are in, or even for that matter, Amrish Nagdoni, for example. Right? So, his, so one is access to these kind of stories. It, does it mean that you are, you are regularly part of these kind of literary circles, which because you go hunting there essentially? If we can, you know, sort of say things like that. No, I keep reading. You know, in the sense, uh, I somewhere get the feeling this probably might uh, be the material for the kind of uh, this one I am looking for. And then uh, from there it develops. You know, sometimes it develops from some sm small little uh, detail. So very often people think you know it develops from the plot. No, the f the idea germinates from a small uh, detail. Sometimes, you know, like while I was doing this, uh, uh, of course now the film that you are watching now after this is Thai Sahiba. The Film has no reference at all to, I mean, it has no, re this one at all to the novel written. In fact, uh, uh, you know, the, after watching the film, the writer said, very beautiful film, but you have borrowed only the title from my book. <laughs> the rest are all yours. I said it doesn't matter. Same thing, you know, even Vaidya, he said the same thing after watching Gulabi Takis. Uh, but you see what happens, you know, that, uh, that novel or that short story, somewhere uh, kind of a, um, f makes you think on certain things, you know. What is the relationship, I myself don't know. Why did I shift the Turing talkies to a television? I don't know. But I have my own argument, why I picked up uh, television and not um, uh, cinema. Or why did I pick up the different time, uh, different time in uh, Thai But Why did I locate the film between the death of Gandhi and death of Nehru? Why not some other time? No, I thought, you know, that's exactly where the Indian polity has started losing its you know, ideals. So I, I started locating that, the story in that, you know. In fact, uh, none of it is there in the original story. So some of them come from my own, you know, experience. Some of them I have heard about such stories and things like that. Uh, all those things, you know, you start 
investing that in that story. Once you invest, you know, then they start growing and then it becomes a full-fledged film. Like, you see, the character of Appa Sahib in Thai Sahib, you know. It's not there in the original novel at all. But I know about a film, Freedom Fighter. It's a very important film, Freedom Fighter from Karnataka, northern part of Karnataka. He was arrested and put behind bar for some time. Once he's released, he became a very religious man. He started his own community, what is it called, sanghas and things like that. I was wondering what happened to his Gandhian ideals. Then, you know, it started uh, bugging me and then I developed this whole argument. What would have happened? And the, thais, uh, the upper cyber character started emerging. And then, you know, I made him, I, uh, Upper, uh, uh, I made Appa Sahib uh, the central character, husband of Thai Sahib, and he has three wives, and all those things I, you know, started bringing in. And, and also, uh, just uh, from a cultural studies perspective, many of many people, scholars as well, think of your films as chronicling you know, certain modern history of India because, you know, even in this retrospective, we planned it that way, that we start Gatashad, with Gatashadda, which is a pre-independence setting, and then Thai Saiba, which transcends just before independence to post-independence to the whole Nairuvian uh, era. And then we move on tomorrow to the whole modern concerns of post-independence India. So it seems like you, of course, I mean, it's something maybe you already have thought of, is something you, you respond to certain kind of uh, contemporary or historical event which is happening through a certain story. And uh, of course, since the message is not neither polemical or didactic, there is, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's in the crevices of your narrative, it's not there on the surface. So, uh, I mean, is this correct to say that you're responding to a certain issue or something you see, or and then you, you know? When I sit down to do the character sketches, I need some historical support. There are filmmakers, Bergman is one such person, who has, none of his films have any political references. I have great respect for that kind of this one also. But then, in my case, I need to have some, I need to peg my character somewhere here and there. That's when, you know, when I decide I should have this between death of Nehru, Gandhi to death of Nehru, I started, you know, sketch, you know, checking out all the major events and try to bring that into the narrative, not forcefully, as a kind of organic flow. And it, in that sense, in it suddenly becomes a chronicling, chronicling of the time. And I have a feeling uh, that's one kind of filmmaking which chronicle, not only filmmaking, it's even in literature. If you look at, uh, say, Malayagala Limadumolo or, say, Marale uh, Mannige, they chronicle the time. They're not mere stories. The chronicling of the history, history of India, history of independence, history of uh, you know, 20th century, things like that. So, uh, so that kind of a this one comes automatically in my. And also, I mean, what I keep telling my students also is that the beauty about art, including film or literature, is that they chronicle that this historical times through the story of ordinary people. Right? It's not telling the story of a great leader or someone like that, which could be a documentary, for example. Whereas here, we are looking at an ordinary person uh, experiencing or stuck in a historical time period and how they navigate. Uh, so that's the power of art in a way. So like all your characters are either on the fringe of the society mm -hmm. or are somebody who are in the lower strata of the society. Or, you know, and many of your characters, which is, I think, the most often asked question to Girish, is about, you know, you seem to be uh, someone who has engaged with, many of your films engage with the story of women. Uh, is, I don't know if it's a conscious 
decision or uh, is this something because the story was good and you didn't think of this angle or is this something <laughs> conscious? Actually, after 15 films that I have made, eight films have female, the rest are <laughs> male oriented. So somebody asked me, uh, why do you pick up female centric films? I said, if I don't pick up female centric, it becomes male centric, that's all. I don't make anything else. But I don't know why the people keeps on talking about, you know, the female-centric uh, film. But you see... I, I think the talking is not just because you're choosing film, but it's all females, but it's also because the, the women in your films, uh, you're entering their minds. It's, there mm. is an interiority of women which is sort of shown. No, so I'm, once I, uh, I, when, uh, this, or somebody asked me this question, I said, not only me, even major filmmakers like Bergman or, uh, uh, you know, this man who makes uh, films about women, they keep on asking them, why do you make films about women? So I told them, why don't you go and ask Kurosa, why does he make films only about men? <laughs> Nobody asks that. They think it is normal. normal. <laughs> but see, this is the whole problem, you know. I, so I'll tell you one thing. Um, there are certain qualities in women, which I observe from the writings of, uh, the novels of uh, Shoram Karant. It is their tolerance and their quality to negotiate with the changing, which is there in uh, Dvipa very much. Even Thai Saiba. That is something which uh, the people the, who think they are powerful, they don't have that. So that is one thing which uh, I have a lot of admiration for, that quality of the women, especially the urban, not the urban women, but the rural women. Second thing is that uh, people keep asking me, why do you make films about only the rural women and rural society? I said most of my films talk about problems of the people who do not have voices. I don't want to talk about, uh, say, uh, 80 people, because they can voice their feeling, you know. They can voice their concerns, they can voice their, uh, this one, effectively. But Nagi, or Hasina, or Emunaka, they can't voice their, you know, problems, articulate their problems. So what I do is, you know, pick that, those characters and bring him to the fore. Thank you. I think Leka is uh, asking me to open up, open it up for questions for the last five minutes. So we are going to open it up for questions. I think we are short of time, so only a few questions. So raise hand and the mic will come to you. Yeah, and question to Girish only, please. Yeah. Hello. Uh, Namaskara. Thank you so much. It was a delight to see a black and white audio film. Um, as a self-taught independent filmmaker for the last six years that I have, uh, the only one question that keeps going on is uh, as a roti kapri kapda makan filmmaking that is in my life how do i go beyond that lens of economics of filmmaking and look at a real drive to keep making stories that connect to my heart and soul and to a lot of other million souls out there as a, not just as a medium but also as a mere existence and why i choose to do filmmaking thank you I don't have answers for this. Because when I set out to make films, I really don't bother about the economics part of it. That's not my headache, that is producer's headache. I tell them this is the budget. I'll somehow see to it that that is finished within that budget. How do I get producers? <laughs> Maybe because uh, nobody else in Canada makes in such small budget, you know, films in such small budgets. <laughs> Come home, I'll tell you how to make films in small budget. <laughs> yes, next, please. Anyone? Yeah, uh, Rohini. When you're uh, right, when you're uh, writing the script for about characters that you know you said are from a voiceless sort of a group, how do you avoid 
uh, or prevent yourself from depicting them as sad or uh, you know uh, full of the sympathy that you may feel. I'm sure everyone feels it, but avoid that because that would be killing the whole experience of the viewer. Uh, that's one thing I uh, <coughs> did in all my films. I don't look uh, at my characters in a very patronizing tone. Uh, Yamunaka is the only exception. Gatshada is the only exception where she is helpless and, you know, where I am trying to tell people, please sympathize with her. In all of my films, you know, they are deprived, they are exploited, but then they have some kind of a self-esteem. And I don't uh, try to say, look here, they are, uh, you know, pathetic and all that. Even in Kansemba uh, Kutre Neri, they are grave diggers, yet they have full of life, full of, you know, josh and all that. That's something that kind of, uh, that's a stance, political stance, as far as I am concerned, it's my political stance. They have that strength and we need to bring that out. I don't want to stay away from them and say, look here, they are poor people. No, that's not my, that's not going to be my head. So if you try to kind of develop a very, a uh, warm feeling towards them, then you also understand their strength. And what would you have avoided for Yamunaka? Pardon? What would you have avoided for, for, for Yamunaka? For what Yamunaka, would you have uh, if I look back at the film, you know, I thought sh I made her a little hel uh, helpless. I could have done it something, you know, some. But my later films are much more complex than Gatra Shratha. Even in uh, Hasina, where she loses her child, but then she doesn't. When the, the Mutwali comes to offer him the offer her the this one, she says, "I don't need your offer now, or your composition now." Same thing happens to Tabra. It's only in a first film, and I know uh, that was there in the version of story. I retained it, but all on, look at uh, especially um, this one. Uh, Gulabi Takis, you know. They tell people, the village people tell her, the island people tell her that you are a Muslim. She says, well, I am going out. But I am not the sufferer, you are the sufferer, she says. She has the audacity to say that. She has the willingness, she has the strength to say that. I won't call that audacity, but the kind of a self-esteem she has, you know. That is something that, uh, as a writer, I need to keep in mind, you know. I don't want anyone to give a feeling that they are helpless, they are pitiable, they are, what is it, uh, you know. I don't, uh, n n n neither Tabra, nor Iria, nor uh, Gulabi, nor Hasina. Yeah. Next. Sir, any hope for uh, any Hindi movie or uh, other? Any? <laughs> Hindi movie. Hindi. I made one Hindi movie that is enough for my life. <laughs> I decided I'll never make a film, Hindi film again. <laughs> is, is, that, is that what you're asking? Like, when, when will he make Hindi movies? Okay. Sir, uh, your son-in-law of Gulbarga. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mrs. Kasroli uh, means, uh, Vaishali Kasroli is from uh, Gulbarga and uh, she is also coming from the theatre. My question is, have you not impressed uh, the language of uh, Gulbarga and the uh, neighboring Pidar and uh, culture of uh, that area? You hey, have not... You, uh, now you are watching Thai Saiba. <laughs> Watch the film and then you can... Yeah, the Thai Saiba has that dialect only and uh, also tomorrow's film, Kanasemba Kudre. Kanasemba Kudre is Bujapur, Kannada, whereas in uh, Gulbarga, it's uh, actually Vaishali uh, did the whole, uh, you know. It's all Gulbarga, Kannada, you know. Sorry, me again. So, who did you think of as your contemporaries? In other words, whose works that you looked up to in the South? I mean, we often hear the names from the West and even Mani Kaul or Ray, but who did you look up to in the South, sir? Especially See, from the, in India, yeah. I only look up to three directors. <laughs> Ray, Sen, and Adur Gopalakrishnan, that's all. <laughs> I think also filmmaking-wise, if you see the very sim many similarities between Ray, 
Adur and Girish in terms of the treatment of Ms. and so on and their meticulous screenplays, which, you know, the 90% is an exaggeration, but, you know, substantial editing is already done in the screenplay. The editor really has not, not much role than to cut where the script says cut. Yeah, uh, I uh, want to ask you in the film uh, Gatashada, uh, the Christian person, I, I'm not saying the Christian person, but the man becomes covered and he leaves, uh, uh, I mean, leaves the town uh, hushedly, right? Uh, could you change it in a way like to make it more uh, supportive for the woman? Mm. Did you have that thing in mind? I didn't have that in my mind because, uh, <clears throat> see, that is uh, only, that would have been just a wishful thinking. Just, I have to look at the socio-political situation of that time. Reality. Reality. And uh, I don't have that kind of freedom to put my, uh, you know, uh, what is this, idealism there. But I have to see I have to tell the view. See, this is here. You know, the man uh, ran away from the place. He could have easily, you know, stayed back and taken her with her, but he ran away. Which, see, if he had stayed back, the film would have had a better, you know, I won't say better ending, kind of a uh, optimistic ending. But that that itself is a wishful ending. That itself is a wrong thing. You know. We need to look at things in a very, very harsh way. If things are not that way, we'll have to say that. And that's the complexity as well, I think, about that you don't expect. In, in fact, yeah. one, of, some of, one of the problems that I have with most of uh, the Indian films, you know, is that not only mainstream, even so-called uh, serious cinema, is that, you know, towards the end, they try to make it look acceptable acceptable in the sense you know oh this is the ideal situation and that is i asked some of the film why did you end it that way this is no we need to tell them what is right or what is wrong don't uh, think audience are all idiots you know tell them the situation and they will they have their own opinion so yeah. there are swamiji's to give you all the answers for all the questions all the problems. It's not the job of the filmmaker to do all the problems. Okay, last two questions. Oh. Uh, sir, this is a bit technical, I think. So I just want to uh, know your uh, take or your description of you know, a vision and a skill set. Like a vision also needs a craftsmanship, like the skill set the person has to possess to uh, execute that. So how would you define two things? A vision, vision and and the skill set that's required, like like the craftsmanship and the vision. Uh, see, cinema is one uh, performing art where the vision is as important. The craftsmanship is as important as the vision. If you only have the vision and if it is not executed properly, the vision won't reach the viewer, or it doesn't reach the viewer the way how you want it to. So that's why both become very important. In fact, I had recently published a book about my own films. It's called Bimba and Bimbana. Bimba means image. Bimbana is process of imaging. For me, both are important. Images or the content alone is not important, even the way how it is expressed. So that's why in film analysis, the Content and the form, syntax, becomes very important. You know. So if uh, somebody doesn't have the kind of it's, uh, syntax which is competent enough, then it's not reaching him properly. You know. So one has to develop that kind of a uh, command over idioms, command over the language, command over the medium, to express it very effectively. In fact, uh, it took me really 30 years to understand the significance of the images of Satyajit Roy. People, you know, 
said, oh, he's a very realistic filmmaker. I said, what is so great about real, being realistic? And it took me really 30, 20, 30 years to understand the, the, the strength of the, the realism that is there in uh, the images of Ray. See, everybody, wherever you place the camera, it captures realism, realistic details. But what is so great about Ray? To understand that, it took me that much time. Because you need to understand his compositions, his mise scene, his rhythm, his tempo. And that is where he, he is able to bring his kind of a transparency to his images. That's why when um, all these uh, Susan Sontag and all these people, uh, Paul and Kay, they keep on using one term, one word, whenever they talk about such traits. They say, relatable. What is it relatable? Why is it, why my images are not relatable? No, see, then we need to understand what is it that makes those images relatable. Why does a man like Kurosawa, such a great filmmaker, says, when I learned about the sad news that Ray passed away, for me, it appeared that cinema has ended. Why did he make a stage statement like that? It's the same case with uh, Ozu. They say images are transparent. How can image be transparent? It's a notion. If you are looking at Chashiro characters in all his films, the father, the actor who plays the role of father in all his films, you understand. He, you get the feeling that he is communicating something which the father in other films have not been able to communicate. Fathers in other films, you know. So this is the quality. How, does, how do they achieve it? They achieve it because they look at all these things, not only from a, from a, from a, just as a technique. They look at it as a kind of a philosophical. That's why I keep telling you, know, it's easy to copy uh, a technique. Because the techniques developed somewhere in the West, probably in Europe or in America. You copy it and use it. So what is the greatness? What is your greatness? Where, where is your artistry in that? So what we need to do is pick up those technical details, or those techniques, convert it into your own idiom. So when you convert that into your own idiom, how does one convert a technique into an idiom? We take all the influences from my own cultural milieu. When I move the camera, or when Ozu doesn't move the camera, that is kind of a you know, decision which force, which is forced by his, by his culture. See, our composition, this one, are all uh, this one from the Western uh, theories. You know, the vanishing point should be one third, two third. Uh, Vanishing point, you know, one third, two third. But Adu doesn't use that. Adu uses the center. The all in all his films, the center, the vanishing point is in the center. And that's where he stands out, because he says my influence is not the uh, this one uh, uh, derived from the West, from the Europe. My notion of composition derives from Kathakali. He says. Say, so look at all our traditional construction. You, know, you have the, this one in the center. Vidhan Sauda, you split the center, in the, so Vidhan Sauda in the center, it becomes equal. First half is similar to second half. Look at all our traditional losses. So, the va oh, vanishing point in an Indian con this is the center of this one. So, and if you simply keep on using it, it becomes a formula. So, that's why you bring some kind of a, what is it, uh, um, theoretical portion to your uh, uh, idiom, your technique, then it becomes an idiom. So, and Ray is 
have been able to do that. Gatak has been able to do that. Adur has been able to do that. And all the masters have been able to do it. So a filmmaker should try to achieve that. You know, this is my argument. So if you ask for any meaning in any of my films, I won't say, uh, Anthony has done it, so I am doing it. No, I won't do that. Because that, I, when, I, when I sat down to make, write a film, I don't think about neither about Antonini nor about Fellini nor about Bergman. I only look at my backyard, what is there from my childhood, what is there in my village, how, do the, how, do, how a priest in a village would respond to this, how the farmer in the village would respond to this. And that becomes the deciding factor for my idiom. Thank you. Uh, oh, uh, only one question, last. Sorry, we screening also is there to us. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Gata Shraddha is based somewhere around Gokarna, coastal Karnataka, right? So is that actually part of the original story or is that a choice you made? And if it was in a different setting, or maybe an urban setting, would the characters have a different, you know, a fate or? It's not set in Gokarna, it's set in Tirthalli. Both uh, <coughs> Anant Murthy is also from the same village. I am also from the same village. And uh, <coughs> that's a hypothetical question. I won't be able to answer that. What would happen if it is, if the locale is shifted to kind of an urban setting? Probably this kind of uh, incident wouldn't have happened at all. Uh, it happens, the, the tragedy happens because it's a closed society. It's an agrahara. Agrahara is a closed society. You know, you have Brahmin houses on all the sides, and other like, other community people are not allowed to come inside. So it becomes a kind of a closed closed society. The the moment it becomes a urban center, especially cosmopolitan centers, these kind of problems will not be there. In Bombay, in a city like Bombay, these problems won't arise. But something else will crop up. So we need to. So that that's why I said it's a hypothetical question. I won't be able to answer it. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Girish, uh, for this excellent conversation. I hope you enjoyed it all. Uh, just I'll briefly introduce the film we are going to watch. It's, uh, it was made in 1997. It's uh, the story in the film travels from about 1940s till death of Nehru, which is 1964. Uh, but the whole story of this uh, political story that we are talking, Gandhi Nehru, is all in the background. The story is actually of this woman who is the wife of a zamindar. And that's why she's called Tai Saiba. Uh, and uh, it won the Golden Lotus. Uh, that's our best national f film. Um, and uh, it's uh, starring Jaimala, who also produced the film. Um, so that's it. So please enjoy it. It's a phenomenal film. I'm going to watch it. So I hope you will also watch it. Thank you. Thank you, Girish, again. Thank you.